Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on uh, where you're joining us from. Uh, my name is Brigitte Vizna. I'm the Director of Policy at Creative Commons, and I'll be moderating the event. Uh, so I'd like to first warmly welcome our panelists and all of you to our panel entitled A New Era of Open, COVID-19 and the Pursuit of Equitable Solutions, where we will be looking at the impact of open data, open science, open access and all things open uh, on the COVID-19 pandemic. And we'll try to draw lessons um, to address it and unfortunately probably possible future challenges that lay ahead. So this panel, as uh, Victoria said, will take the shape of an informal conversation between our invited panelists, and we'll close with a Q&A session uh, with questions or comments from our participants. Uh, so before I introduce our distinguished panelists, um, allow me to put this panel in context. So back in March 2020, almost one year ago to the day, uh, Creative Commons published an article entitled, Now is the Time for Open Access Policies, Here's Why. And that was in response to the COVID-19 pandemic um, just starting at the time. And we felt it back then that it was imperative to underscore the importance of open access, specifically open science in times of crisis. Now, one year on, uh, a lot has changed uh, in the landscape and it's important to assess the progress made and also take a hard look at the dangers ahead. So in this panel, we'll examine the fields of open data, open science, and open source medical hardware with leading experts and attempt to map out the present and the future of open in the era of COVID-19. We'll consider questions like, what does open mean in the context of COVID-19? Has it been strengthened or weakened uh, throughout the crisis? And what lessons can we learn from the current crisis? Finally, will open also be the response when humanity will face the next pandemic? Uh, to answer these questions, I will have the pleasure to be speaking with um, Dr. Tarek Lubani, who's a Canadian doctor and humanitarian. Uh, he runs the GLIA project, which seeks to provide medical supplies to impoverished locations. He developed a low-cost stethoscope in 2015. Uh, he's associate professor of, at the University of Western Ontario and works in emergency room. I also have the pleasure of speaking with uh, Dr. Tim Hubbard, who is professor of bioinformatics at the Department of Medical and Molecular Genetics at King's College London. Uh, professor Hubbard is a um, head of genome analysis at Genomics England and honorary faculty at the Wellcome Trust Sanger Institute in Cambridge, UK. Um, Dr. Hubbard's, Hubbard's research interests are in bioinformatics, computer, computational biology, and genome informatics. Um, and our final um, panelist will be Dr. Uma Suthar Sanan. She's professor of global intellectual property law at Queen Mary University of London. Um, she uh, is the academic director of the LLM program in intellectual property law and the deputy director at Queen Mary Intellectual Property Research Institute. She's currently working on a monograph on copyright and public interest, comparative and historical analyses. Um, before we start, I'd like to thank Victoria Heath, uh, our communications manager, who's the panel's organizer extraordinaire and will be facilitating the Q&A at the end of our event. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge Alison Pierce, our events manager who made this virtual panel possible. So without Alison and Victoria, we wouldn't be all here. So thank you very much to both of you. So without further ado, I'd like to start our conversation by asking one question to all our panelists. And this question is, what does open mean in the COVID-19 context? Perhaps uh, Uma, you would like to go first. Thank you, over to you. You have to unmute yourself, so. That was a rookie mistake. Thank you very much for inviting me to this event, Brigitte and, and Victoria. I, I, I don't want to seem like a skeptical lawyer here, but open means a lot of lovely, glorious things. And I'd like to come on board for this panel to say nothing can happen without the proper legal tools. So um, when we say open, do we mean 
cross specialization in terms of interdisciplinary studies. There's a lot of talk about open science, but in my mind, why only open science and not open humanities, for example? Um, there's open mean collaboration between different types of people, collaboration uh, with different types of institution. Um, but does it mean open education? There's only so much you can do with open science and data, but you have to teach people how to get to that data and science. To the third thing, which I really wanted to talk about today was, as well, is um, open platforms. That, that, that you can have a lot of openness going around, but if there are no bridges, and if the platforms are all closed, and you have to do a paywall, it's, it's still shut. So uh, open means a lot of things, yeah, in that context. Thank you. Tim, you'd like to go next? So one of the things that's happened as a result of COVID is you've seen a vast amount of people publishing in open um, pre-publication uh, platforms. Almost everything that's been analysis of the epidemic and data around it has been published on those platforms first. Of course, that's led to a few cases of things being published which turned out not to be robust. Um, but I think in general, it's you know it's just pushed a movement that was already there um, to have pre-publication um, almost immediately rather than waiting around for journals and waiting for peer review. Um, so I think that's one been one thing that's happened as a result of this. Um, on the data front, there's been this you know I'm now you know I come from the Human Genome Project, which of course the open human genome was a major thing to make sure you could build research on top of it, that it wasn't behind a paywall, as Uma said. Um, but of course, this is a very, very different world when you're dealing with medical data. People are very sensitive about that. We've seen all the worries around apps for tracking testing, for example, um, privacy concerns around that. So, but I think the population as a whole has seen the benefit and the need for being able to do real-time analysis of what the state of infection is. And somehow you have to put that in place. Now, at least in the UK, we've done that by relaxing the rules. Um, but I think afterwards, we're going to have to find, you know, better ways of enabling research while still maintaining privacy um, in the long term, because you know, COVID, a lot of COVID data isn't very sensitive, actually. Um, you know, certainly the virus itself, it's not very sensitive. But um, if we want to get the benefit of doing this across all healthcare information, we have to, you know, we want to make it easier for people to do research, but still preserve privacy. And I put a link in the chat about one of the technological solutions that we're using in the UK. Principle being, you can look at the data but you have to come into an environment to do that and you can't take any of that data away so you you get away from the idea of data sharing you share information that's that's summary information but the raw data itself stays locked away and of course from Omar's point of view of terms of you know is that behind a paywall it doesn't doesn't necessarily have to be behind a paywall but it certainly has to be behind some mechanism to know who those researchers are and to make sure there's ethical oversight of what they're doing because of the privacy and ethical concerns. Right. And we'll 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 get to that question in detail in the conversation. I think that there the tension between um, the need to make things open but also privacy considerations is certainly something that needs to be addressed. Um, Tarek, would you like to pick up on this? Yeah, I think it's a great question because it kind of mixes two things, one of which is what is the actual definition that we see for openness, but also um, how is it working out practically as a result of COVID? And I want to kind of pull on one of the strings that Uma had sort of uh, put out there, the idea that the legal tools aren't really working. I actually quite agree with that. 
But where I might differ a little bit with Uma is I think that rather than trying to place primarily legal tools that facilitate more openness, especially for me in the medical device space, what I think we have to do is we have to start another front. And what COVID showed us is that we can have that other front, a public relations front or a social front rather than a strictly legal court-based front uh, in which we force companies not necessarily to lose legal battles because truly they haven't, but rather force them through shaming or through other uh, social pressure mechanisms to open up what they have. Uh, for example, uh, we made a device that required some ISO standards. And one of, one of my colleagues who is heavily involved in this, Dr. Azad Mashari, had um, been talking about how this thing was stopping us, you know, and then ISO released all, the, all of those standards. They didn't do it because they lost anything. They did it because we all demanded it. We said to them that this is not a moment where that can happen. So it's been, it's, it's interesting. I mean, clearly open means that we should be able to do what we want with information so long as it helps other people in one way or the other. But also practically what it's meant over the last year is that we basically have, um, through social means, threatened these companies. Either you start helping the people around you or you'll have to pay some consequences. Very interesting because one of my questions was, did COVID strengthen the did it weaken it? And I think you probably have um, different views on this, but from what I'm hearing, Tarek, uh, there seems to be uh, at least a strengthening of, in, the social, uh, in the social pressure around open much more than anything that could have happened on a legal front. So I think that's quite interesting that the open um, um, concept has been broadened actually to encompass more social norms or um, social pressure mechanisms to to expand beyond uh, the legal framework. I wonder if anyone has any thoughts on whether open has been strengthened or weakened or has it evolved in any way through the crisis? I think it's been strengthened. And this business about public pressure, I mean, I don't think it's the first time we've seen that. There's something a bit similar, although a lot of it was legal as well, around HIV, um, ARVs, um, particularly in South Africa, the very big cases there that led to the Doha Declaration, um, that public health actually can trump intellectual property in certain circumstances. And, you know, to some extent, that's still reverberating. a lot of times people used to think of um, patent law, for example, as some piece of esoteria that didn't necessarily impact them. And now at almost all levels of society, we're seeing how impactful they are. There is really no great reason why the world is behind in vaccinations right now. And yet uh, it's, it's that the way in which they, the companies have dealt with patents that means that we're going to be behind for some time. Um, so I, I agree with Tim. I think certainly we've been strengthened, um, but at the same time, some of it has been uh, false promises. For example, some releases of patents that have happened that are not really all that genuine. For example, the ventilator patents. Uh, there were some old ventilator patents that were released that don't meaningfully progress us or, or threaten the business models of some of the largest players in the market. So that basically they say, okay, if you want to make second tier or third tier devices for people, go ahead, here's the patents. But if you want the best stuff, then only we can do it. So I, I do think it's been a, a bit of a mixed bag too. Shall I come in and appreciate it? Um, I, I don't want to preempt any discussion on compulsory licensing. However, having heard both Tarek and Tim, I have to say one good thing is, and, and, and Tarek is especially right, the number of times the word pattern came up in newspaper leaders, um, and that was good. Uh, of course, you know, lawyers will say, but we have been talking about this for a long time since 
um, before the Dewa Declaration, yes, and Tina was really good to point that out. But it has taken a momentum. And um, so what we should do, but then that's the next part I was going to talk about, is try and push the language a lot more. Um, I think a lot, there is a lot to do with language as well as science in self-advocacy of openness. I would be curious to know your thoughts about um, the compulsory licensing and how this intersects with uh, the open movement. Well, um, first of all, I'm, I'm, I'm sure if you talk to an IP owner and mention the word compulsory licensing, there is shock horror on their faces. Um, and and that's something that has to be debated a lot more openly to persuade people that um, intellectual property rights did not descend from God, they're not uh, immutable, uh, imprescriptible. They are state-granted property rights. And what the state gives, the state can take. And the state does do this, and it has done this for centuries when it comes to essentials. Um, that there, there is a lovely, um, to me, exciting concept in competition law for essential facilities, where the state has the right to go in and say, I know it's yours, but sorry, um, the entire country needs to have access to your property to get to the only port available to the entire country, and that's it. And we accept that. Um, and it's not... It hasn't got anything to do with capitalism or socialism or communism to try and get away from that language. It is just an essential facility for millions to live. And we are seeing that in relation to some types of intellectual property rights. And it's not just patents. Um, as Tarek was talking about those sort of medical devices, um, we have had some cases in the United Kingdom in relation to design rights as well. Um, and in relation to all those filtration systems that we required, a lot of people actually started downloading CAD files uh, and design files and, and 3D printing them out as well. So you have a whole range of design rights, a bit of copyright, and of course the patterns on the vaccines and the kits. Um, but, but some types of rights, are affixed, I think, to what you call public goods. And I, I was so happy when I saw the Financial Times, you know, doing a whole leader on this and calling on the fact that why are we not taking away or imposing compulsory license on what are essentially public goods? So uh, compulsory license, maybe we change the word, but it is really a collaborative legal tool it is competition law going in and saying, hang on, I'm sorry, but it's essential. It's essential to the state, it's essential to the public. And at that point, and that's something that's hard to tell Parma openly, but we should, at that point, their private property does become quasi-public. Um, of course, and, of yeah, course no, you know, you know, you talk about national ability to, to change these things, but of course it's more difficult once you've got the TRIPS agreement, which kind of wraps you into an international framework. There is, of course, a sort of halfway house if you can't, you know, as a, instead of compulsory licenses, there are things like patent pools, which have been used effectively for ARVs. Um, and, you know, I think the patent pool is there, there is talk about extending that to other things other than just um, HIV medicines, where you know you, where the, the license there allows local manufacture on payment of some agreed fee. I definitely agree with you that the international frameworks through which these kind of circulate complicate things a little bit. But what they've functionally done is they've really deprived us of the ability to fight local battles. That's both a disadvantage and an advantage because now we have to form more or less global coalitions. You know, even if you think of just the four of us here, we represent at least three countries, I think, 
Um, and, and it really means that we have to come together uh, because no one country can really take on the system, especially countries that really need it the most, the poor countries or impoverished countries. So I, I agree. I think it really is problematic and that globalization piece presents a new unique challenge. But the opportunity that comes on the flip side of that is that it forces us to collaborate in ways that we never really did before. You know, like, is Creative Commons an American institution? Maybe. But is it a global movement? Yes, for sure. And that's the same for open source medical devices, especially in the last year and so many of the other open movements. I agree that we should all do that. And it's, it's, it's been wonderful to see the CC license appearing in so much of academic literature. And that's amazing. Um, however, if it should go to court, we should have a framework to back it up. And that, that's, that's what I'm saying. That it, it, it's Sorry, again, to be such a skeptical lawyer, but um, it, it's wonderful we all come together and hold hands. But, but I do think everyone should also boost up which countries have done the compulsory licensing because that's the one that gives you the sort of nuclear power to negotiate as well. And number two, have you seen how Europe's been behaving? That there is a sort of nationalism still in a pandemic scenario. So... Yeah, that's been a downside, certainly. This panel, we're kind of taking different positions, but I think we all agree generally that there's a legal piece, but that's not sufficient. There's a public piece, but that's not sufficient. And that really they interplay uh, a lot into yeah. each other, which I think probably at least us having watched Creative Commons' work, um, that's what we see with Creative Commons. That's what we see with some of the historical figures attached to Creative Commons is that they married the public understanding of the importance of these arcane uh, intellectual property rules with actual solid legal frameworks. Well, of course, and it, you can extend from copyright to, well, it is part of copyrights, um, open source licensing, which you could also say, well, how solid is the legal framework there? But it's, it's you know, the entire large fraction of the software economy now ba is based upon it, and it seems to generally work fairly well. It seems exactly that there are some struggles, but we also have great examples of, uh, of success stories. And um, I'd like to, to um, ask you, uh, Tarek, um, because it's, it's just been announced recently that your organization, your project, GLIA, uh, just announced that it will make and provide uh, open source medical hardware in the US. Um, congratulations. Um, what what opportunities lie in in this initiative can you tell us a little bit more about it and also what challenges are you expecting along the way to kind of uh, briefly frame glia glia really came out of desperate need in uh, one of the poorest countries in the world or regions in the world that had essentially no access to medical devices and so initially, I find it's very easy for us to frame around that and say, OK, well, we need to do something in these other places. But very often, I, I live and work in Canada as well. It's easy to forget that what we are doing and how we are operating um, actually involves so much more than, than um, the international environment. And so coming to the States and trying to break the inequality of care, fundamentally GLIA is all about bridging the access to care gaps that exist between rich people and poor people. Well, as we know from the States and from other rich countries in the world, that's not just a third world problem. That is also a first world problem. Um, and that's what we're really excited about with, with the US. It's a big project. It's a tough regulatory environment. We've already acid tested our medical devices in some of the poorest parts of the world. And now it's time to acid test our ability with the regulatory environment so that we can provide people with tools that are properly licensed and usable. What's been your experience so far? Can you, can you share a little bit and maybe what you expect to happen along that journey? Yeah, so right now we've sort of set up a lab that has some 3D printers and is going to start making devices. 
Of course, there's all of the pieces of that, the regulatory piece, the standards piece, uh, et cetera. Um, and, and we're just sort of working through it. There, uh, again, the states, whereas it is technically a first world country, has lots of parts where the medical system looks very third world. And so we're picking out low income neighborhoods, low income clinics, and making sure that we provide there while at the same time getting buy-in from everybody in, in, that, uh, in the country and sort of in the American society. So it's been, it's been a great project so far getting set up and we're really looking forward to um, sharing more with people. There's of course gonna be announcement on social media and everything like that for people to follow. And we're looking for people who can help in terms of the regulatory piece, in terms of some of the engineering pieces, in terms of some of the production pieces. The first production facility is in St. Louis, uh, and then there will be others around the country as time goes on. And specifically, we're trying to get these stethoscopes into the hands of, of course, the, the low-income clinics, but also some of the medical students, because we find that one of our main missions is also to change the culture around medical devices and convince people that what you're doing is, is uh, much better when you have direct access to your devices, when you can think about them, when you can modify them. All of the things we consider the freedoms of software, we're now trying to transfer to become the freedoms of hardware, including the right to repair, including the right to create, including the right to, to um, modify. It's very inspiring. So if we translate those ideas about the freedom um, to build upon what already exists and improve things, um, if we translate this into the, the data world, uh, I'd like to know from you, Tim, um, what role can open access and op the open community in general uh, play to ensure that there is timely and equitable access to the research outputs and the data itself in order to uh, face those challenges? So actually, I wanted to ask Tarek, because, you know, if you, it's fine to have this openness with the equipment, but then you have a little problem there. If it's collecting data about individuals, how do you ensure the privacy of that data um, for those individuals? I mean, they may not care. You know, we could all become totally relaxed about our medical privacy, but I don't see that happening anytime soon. Right now, it's one of the most, you know, controversial things, um, you know, the, the accessibility of medical data, which then course can be very useful for handling epidemics and understanding who's most at risk. I mean, that's one of the, you know, we, we know that not everybody gets COVID badly, but who are the ones who get COVID badly? It's only through research that we're going to understand that better and understand what sort of treatments need to be developed or need to be repurposed. Um, but that comes with accessing people's medical records. And if you're a device manufacturer, you're part of that equation of collecting, you know, there's, there's of course, that can be used in the opposite way. Uh, medical device manufacturers jealously guard the data they've collected in many cases and don't feed that back to the medical system. But then if you're building an open framework, you've got to work out how can I build an open framework and still feed that data in a secure way back into maybe that, those person's patient records. It's a great question, and um, I, I would be lying if I said I have the answers already, but I think the idea here is what your base design is. Just like we're open by design, we have a completely open stack right down to the bottom. Um, you know, my computer, as, as we were sort of discussing before the panel, is running Linux, and I've been running that for a while. So it's a completely open setup, but also it's privacy by design. We don't collect data that exposes people. Uh, will we make mistakes? Yes. Will some people be able to de-identify data? Sure. Um, but I think when that's the main framework, it, it changes things. And I want to go a step further because one of the, the places where we work, and actually one of the places where GLIA started, is a place under military occupation. And so when we went in with a pulse oximeter, think of what data a pulse oximeter collects. Essentially nothing and essentially for no time. And yet people, uh, and the other one being electrocardiogram, pulse oximeter collects your oxygen readings, electrocardiogram does a heart tracing. People were terrified 
to allow us access to that data because, of course, they were worried that the military, the occupying military, would somehow be able to hack into those systems and take it. And so all data storage has to happen with these you know, one-time keys and things like that that only the patient has access to. I mean, it's a nightmare in terms of ease of use, but uh, it, it really does protect people because at the end of the day, medicine is no good if you're not trusted. It's a game of confidence. And if you're not trusted by your patients, it's not going to work. So I think to sort of summarize that, like, this is a big problem. We're trying to design for it from the get-go. Uh, and we're very aware that, you know, we're, we're going to make mistakes. And so the best way to approach that is to be honest and open, not just in what we're doing and how we're collecting so that we can receive some review of that, but also in the mistakes that we make going forward. So I think what you said about you know, privacy by design, I mean, that is the fundamental thing. This can't be an add-on. And one of the evolutions yeah. we've seen is, you know, if you're using a lot of data, it, you know, certainly in terms of making that accessible to lots of people to do analysis, the cloud is a great engine for that because it's so easy to use you know, anywhere in the world. As long as you have an internet connection, you haven't got to run your own computers. The question then is privacy. But a lot has happened over the last five years in the design of cloud systems where the cloud providers, they just want to sell you compute time on their systems. And they actually want to be able to say, you know, we can't look at your data even if we want to because the security design is good enough. And I think we've reached that stage. Um, you know, they, they have to, if they want to sell services to banks, they have to offer that. It's the same for medical data any data that's private to the citizen. So we, it's technologically possible to do this now, but it, does, it just requires good engineering design and good oversight to make sure that it really is as secure as you claim it is to ensure that there's trust from the population. Yeah, and I think over and above these, these technical um, mechanisms in place. I think there also has to be some clarity on the legality of it because we are seeing this tension between the value of making things as open and as freely accessible as possible so that scientists all over the world can, can build all these ideas, but at the same time, privacy seems to be um, erecting a barrier to, to this sharing. So I wonder how we can navigate this tension maybe from a legal standpoint um, I was wondering, Uma, if you have some insights on how to ensure that we can recalibrate this tension between uh, the need for privacy on the one side, but also the need to share openly for the advancement of, of knowledge and um, in, in scientific progress and finding a cure to the pandemic. The, the usual way it's been done is through propertizing it and using that property of the database to protect the privacy. So ironically, um, if the privacy of patients is very, very high on the agenda, you are looking at mechanisms that go exactly opposite to the open access mechanism. And, and as Terikas has said so clearly, you do need the data um, in relation to find out which types of persons get COVID, uh, where exactly you need, you know, a particular source of vaccination. So, I mean, one way to do it would be how the European Union has done it, but I am, I, 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 I am quite discouraged by it because the tension is very clear there. What they've done is to have a very strong privacy law and data protection laws. However, the new 2019 copyright um, in the digital market, which applies especially to cloud data and everything you know uh, in digital databases, has strengthened user rights and given text and data mining exceptions. How it will turn out in terms of balance, we have to wait for a court case. There has often, but, but this is not unusual. There, there is tension everywhere in relation to fundamental rights. 
and and we're just dealing now with the latest privacy rights versus you know the right to um, education, the right to science uh, to benefit from culture. Um, if it does go to court or whatever tribunal, you're going to have to do a proportionality test. Um, so in the, in the case of a pandemic, I, I cannot see how a court is going to put a lot of credence on personal privacy notions if the data is going to help 5 million, 70 million people. It, it will have to come down to that. Um, because it always is a proportionality test. Who, uh, which, interests which public interest is outweighed here uh and if it's an in, if it's a community a small community that that wishes to keep its you know uh, its data protected vis-a-vis -vis the fact that it could help an entire country i'm i'm quite sure the courts would go for it, it's it's quite star trek isn't it um the needs of the many out, outweigh the needs of the few of the one so, I mean, I, there's some chat from Pierre. I was asking, you know, is 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 um, laws enough? I was asking you. Um, uh, I mean, I personally also, laws are useful. You know, when we have people accessing data, we get them to sign legal contracts that they're not going to try and re-identify people, for example, and that means that you know they're basically on notice that if they get caught doing that, they'll get prosecuted. But I wouldn't rely on laws to protect against the kind of Snowden type things, um, you know, governments, etc., and commercial companies, you know, once the data is outside your control, you don't really know exactly what's happening. So strong technological protections where you are the data controller, you might be using a cloud platform, but you have the keys for the encryption you control the keys. That is a strong technological mechanism that seems reasonably robust as long as the engineering has been checked, um, and you know you can do certification and, and, and you know penetration testing on that. So I think there are ways to, um, but you need a combination of technological and legal protections to kind of give confidence that data really is held securely. Uh, yeah, and, and just to add that there are legal provisions that also make it um, a, 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 a offence to break those technological measures that Tim was talking about. So um, if you do break digital locks on protected data it, 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 in the European Union and under the international legal format, it is an offence as well. But but would you guys just come back to one point about um that, that Terry and Tim were talking about uh how could law possibly help with the um, message of open data and open science and the openness. And I was thinking about how the Creative Commons started and one of the biggest messages I recall Lawrence Lessig doing was to marry it to a very you know rigid legal structure and then to say but and then this is how we can get out of it in a way um but but in order to boost this openness i did wonder whether the, the creative commons you know organization has looked into marrying it to human rights because you see one of one of the things that keeps coming up on this panel is what about the data what about the privacy what about the the right to education because i i think very much having a lot of openness um it, it doesn't make sense without accompanying it with also open teaching methods. Um, you, you have to teach people how to use the medical equipment, how to actually access a database, what to do with that database as well. Um, whether or not this whole open movement can be linked to the existing rights. We don't need new rights, the existing uh, format that's already there in the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. It, it's all there. The UN Special Rapporteur for Human Rights has already kept saying that's how we do 
patents, copyrights. We need to relook at it. So I, I did wonder whether that was a better way to go at it. But I don't know. I think it's really interesting what you're saying because it shows that the open movement doesn't exist for its own sake, uh, that it is there to try to achieve uh, higher goals. And one of them is uh, access to medicine. Another one might be access to education. Another one might be uh, access to information. Uh, simply as a citizen, I, I, I want to understand what this pandemic is about. And I think that the open movement is an enabler for citizens to be able to, to exercise their fundamental rights. So it also builds on not only the copyright system or the intellectual property system, but tries to transcend that in order to enable the realization of, of fundamental rights. And I think that that's where perhaps when we adopt a more nuanced approach to open, where we see that there might be limits that are drawn in from privacy uh, concerns or, or other uh, fundamental rights that might uh, be affected. I, I think that that's what makes us realize that open is a means in order to achieve that goal. And I wonder, if, in your experience, um, Tarek, do you think that um, uh, achieving your goals has been really hampered by these ex existing heavy structures that Uma is referring to and that open is has been the way to free it up and achieve those goals? Yeah, it's it's funny because a lot of people look at me, for example, or people who work with Glee and they say, oh, these are fundamentalists. They're doing open for open. Mm -hmm. And what they don't realize is that even if open weren't the most ethical way forward, it is actually the most practical way forward, especially for the work that we're doing. During the pandemic, and actually even over the last few years, one of the things that we've realized is that we've crossed a lot of these bridges. You know, everybody saw what it was like to have the supply chain fall apart. So when Glia was able to get going with face shields and with other medical PPE uh, protective equipment, we weren't exercising some kind of uh, ideological fundamentalism. We were being practical, being driven by this, this different way of doing things. And, and so when we talked also to some of the regulatory bodies and were able to move them along with us in terms of how a 3D printed device is good or how uh, a small group can manufacture high quality medical devices, we crossed bridges. The, the issue is I think there are lots of interests that want us to go back when this is over. And one of our duties here is to burn the bridges. You know, we cannot go back to the way that it was before. We cannot go back to having essentially complete supply chain dependence. We cannot go back to a place where medical devices get wrapped in years and years and years of patents, even when people are dying. I mean, yes, lots of people, I think it's two and a half million people have died during this pandemic. But millions of people die of other preventable causes every year. And sure, not all of them are going to be solved by a 3D printer. I get that. I'm not a techno utopian. But at least some of them can be solved by, by making available these patents and these rights and these, uh, these mechanisms to other people. ask the same question to you, how, how does the values of open have uh, come into play in the work that you've done in, in sequencing the, the virus genome? So, so the virus genome is easy because it's, you know, it's, there's not a privacy problem there. Anything which isn't human data, it's fine. And so that's been sequenced openly and made available. Um, the problem comes when you have human data. So we're also sequencing humans who are severely affected to try and understand why they're severely affected. And of course, that's your whole human genome and that's a very private thing and is covered by GDPR. So that has to be secure. But the slices of data which can be made open. Um, and so, you know, there's, this is just part of that, that sort of open data movement, um, which has... You know, this, you know, going back 20 years when the human genome was done, the idea of making all of that data available within 24 hours of it being determined, 
because that was an anonymized individual, um, you know, was novel at the time. At the time, scientists would keep data secrets um, many times for many years because they wanted to publish more and more papers. And the idea of making it available before even the first publication was made available was somewhat novel, at least in the biological and medical sphere. So we have come quite a long way. Um, and maybe this is one of the first examples where you know, a global pandemic, and it's made very clear the value of medical data in as far as possible, also being available to many people to analyze. And that this will, this certainly has changed things in terms of just linking up data, medical data for care purposes, which was hard in itself before. It suddenly moved, we were saying inside the health system that we've done more in 10 months than we've previously done in 10 years. So that's not quite open data. I definitely agree that we've moved a lot in the last year. And my biggest fear is that move backwards. And so lots of my thinking right now is how do we um, cement our gains as much as possible and prevent backsliding? Because if we walk out of this with some framework about how to help people in all parts of the world with inventions that are made in one part of the world, I think that's going to be a huge advancement. And if and we're, we're headed there. But if we allow ourselves to go back to the way it was before, then it would be just such a lost opportunity and such a shame. No, I, 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 and I, I go back to the view that um, the openness has to be anchored. And what I'd like the openness anchored to is rights. The fact that your open movement is actually fighting for the rights of others, um, because so much it's been open, as if you know, as, as Tarek said, you know, very Panglossian utopian group of people versus property rights owners. But it's actually about the rights of everyone else in society, the right to culture, science, education, as well as health, um, and and that's what the openness should I, I i wish it was uh you know so it's also geared to the sustainable development goals it's geared to yeah your own fundamental rights right and so do you think that um now we've looked at how open has has played out during this pandemic and how it has encountered challenges but so far i think that it has come out stronger because the public in general has seen the benefits of having open access to not only um, the research outputs, but also the, the medical hardware. I think this is, this is truly a revolution, but how can we ensure that um, we can prevent the next pandemic? How, do we, how can we make sure that we don't get to that stage of March, 2020, where we all have to pause and see what's happening around the world. How can we make sure that what we know now and what we have learned through this pandemic um, in terms of promoting access to information, access to scientific research, access to data, access to hardware, how do we make sure that this will help us prevent uh, a, a future global crisis? Um, so you on that my... side, you're going to need you know, you just have to have investment around the world by governments to pay for the kind of monitoring that's necessary. I mean, I always compare this to biology. I mean, you know, one body, 37 trillion cells, somehow it doesn't fall apart because biology's got all kinds of safety check mechanisms running all the time. We just don't spend enough on that kind of stuff. And politicians, you know, that's the budget they'll cut first. Um, the monitoring budget, um, CDCs and the equivalents of those are not well enough financed. And I'm sure this will lead to uh, increased funding for that kind of monitoring. Um, but it probably will get cut back over time as, you know, it's like, um, you know, earthquake protection, but although that is very well codified in places with high earthquake risk. But, um, you know, global challenges like this, it's going to be difficult to persuade policymakers 
that they have to maintain this sort of risk register type approach to monitoring. Uh, if I can add uh, something to that, I think obviously what Tim is saying is absolutely dead on. What, what I wanted to add was a story of a man who's very famous in the medical world, a guy named Verkow, who was sent in to sort of examine a typhus epidemic and concluded, you know, they sent him in expecting him to say, like, go clean up some things and give them some clean water. And he said that the way to solve these issues and prevent their recurrence is, I think his words were like democracy and her daughter's liberty and good education. And I think that that's the level at which really we would have to be to prevent the next pandemic. I think we can all be relatively sober here and realize that uh, we as humanity will not learn the lessons that we should learn. Yes, we need to increase monitoring. Yes, we need to do all of this. But I do think that our, our struggle, if we're very genuine about stopping it from ever happening again, is much more fundamental and has to do with ensuring, you know, what Uma was talking about, the rights of everybody in presenting it. I, I love that framing that uh, Uma, may, Uma had of rather than presenting it as a bunch of idealists versus a bunch of owners, present it as people with differing rights that are competing and how those rights should touch each other. Uma, would you like to comment on this? <laughs> No, I mean, I, I think Tim put such an eloquent position forward as to this. And I mean, I was thinking, oh gosh, why is she asking a lawyer how to prevent the next pandemic? Um, there is absolutely nothing the law can do to prevent it. However, can I just say, all the openness that has been shown by the publishers in relation to scientific publishing and COVID-19 related publications are short term. So, um, and as we know, governments around the world have been quite gung-ho about passing laws for emergency measures and, you know, crowd control and mask control. Um, now may be the time to push them into widening user rights via exceptions. Um, why? Because in the past, the research exceptions have been curtailed. So make it wider in, in IP laws for medical health, uh, emergencies, um, educational exception. Canada has a, one of the widest educational copying exception in the world. Um, and so does China. And, um, and let's follow them instead. Um, yeah up here but our laws aren't too bad so. uh, i i do realize that trying to prevent it might be a, a tall for for you umar for anyone but how do you think and this will be my last question because we have about five minutes before we open for q a but how could the con concept of open and the future of how we see open uh, help us prepare and help us anticipate uh, these these questions. Do you think that um, if we do push for more openness, we will be more prepared? I'd like to hear your thoughts on this. Um, okay, I don't see anyone else muting, so I'll I'll throw in first. Um, I think the short answer is yes. And again, that's not coming from an ideological, but rather a very practical place. And I think it really happens on all those levels we've talked about. Um, I, don't, I don't agree with Uma about her, her self-perception of her lack of importance. Like, I think the lawyers are such a huge part of both the problem and the solution here. I mean, all these treaties, they, were, they may have been negotiated by, by uh, politicians, but they were activated by lawyers. And we in the movement have not really focused on that, haven't had good enough lawyers to help us stay open. So making the laws open helps. Making the medical equipment open helps. Making the data around it open helps. And I think all of those things will leave us much better prepared in the future. Just on the impact of the law, I mean, I would say that I think the GDPR has been very 
positive because it has forced a whole load of organizations which were completely lax about handling data to get their house better under control and you know take the issues of privacy seriously which it wasn't really being done before that's a sort of side issue to this Um, it's a tough question. Uh, I, I would have to say, on top of the law, if we need money, uh, a, a lot of the, um, the exchange of data, um, the collaboration that occurred was funded by governments, um, really. Um, the, um, we can't talk about public-private partnerships in openness because that there has already a lot of the research is already funded uh, and underpinned with governmental backing and funding. So in one sense, that's why I, I went for the right angle, because the public have a right to open data in many cases, because the public has actually funded the research. So I, I, that's why I'm, I'm going like, can we marry the notion of openness to um, the notions of the rights of the public? Um, just to go back to what Claire said about the law, what is depressing for me is the language is already there. Uh, it just doesn't come out. Perhaps it's not that there's not enough PR for that language. Um, the, the, the causes are there. They're all sitting around. Um, and when the UN reporters report came out, you know, not many people read it perhaps, but it's all there. Um, so maybe the open movement is the one to pull it up because it's sitting there waiting for a great big global realization of it. Yeah. I think this is a yeah very inspirational uh, statement and uh, I think a great segue into the next part of this panel, which is going to be about opening the floor to participants. Uh, it's really my favorite part of the panel to see uh, what the audience wants to know, what we maybe haven't covered. And um, I'll hand over to Victoria. I see that there were many questions in the chat uh, as our panelists were uh, speaking. And I'll hand over to Victoria to um, uh, lead us through the Q&A. Over to you. Thank you, Brigitte. Um, I'll do a virtual clap for you. That was really great moderating. Um, yeah, there were a ton of questions. I've been trying to keep up with them throughout the panel. So I apologize to anyone. Um, we can't sort of get to every single question, but uh, this event will actually stay live, I guess you could say. We might all go away, but the event chat will still be here once the event ends. So if you want to talk to each other on the chat, you definitely could do that. There's also a networking function um, to your left. There, there's a little symbol that has like two hands uh, shaking. So if you actually want to talk to anyone who is attending the event today, you can just go to the networking um, function on Hopin and do that as well. Um, and of course, if you want to ask any of the panelists questions that we're not able to cover today, um, I would definitely encourage you to pose them uh, to them on Twitter. So the first question that um, I think would be really interesting to talk about, um, and I think I'll sort of pose this to Tarek first because it connects to something you said earlier about the importance of trust in our healthcare system and with our healthcare providers. Um, and Pierre posed a question about, um, there's a lot of issues around people trusting vaccines right now, especially what we see with trust in the AstraZeneca vaccine. Um, and it's not really, people worried about how long these vaccines are being developed by patents, but it's more of fear that they're being developed too quickly and that there's not enough regulatory scrutiny. Um, what do you think could help solve that fear? Is that something open access could help solve? Or is this just a fundamental fear that people have with how fast things are moving right now? Um, I think about this a lot. So I've received my vaccine. I work in an emergency room in a first world country. So like almost every uh, emergency doctor in a first world country, I've been vaccinated. And so has everybody I know in the medical field. So we clearly are convinced. When we look, we've been dealing with vaccine hesitancy for as long as I've been in medicine. And really what we found is that there aren't any very easy ways through to it. Uh, I'd like to say that, yes, open access will do it, but 
That's not quite it. Really what it requires is being open to people, being compassionate and non-judgmental, and just talking them through the information. And of course, the other thing that, that the medical literature has found that I think we're rediscovering again is that expertise matters. So people don't want, for example, uh, the left president or the right president to get up and say, yes, you should do this, even if that's their own party. What they want is experts to tell them what they've found in a way that makes sense and to dispel the myths. So I think that, that it's as much as it might, it would be convenient for this panel to say, yes, open access will solve this. I don't think that the fear is necessarily rational. And so I don't think that, uh, that these new tools are as necessary as just sticking to the things we know, telling people what we know, using expertise and trusted figures to deliver it to them and keeping it completely apolitical. So I basically agree with that, but not completely, because I think the pharmaceutical industry has had a patchy reputation with clinical trials. And so openness, greater openness around clinical trials, which has been coming, people like Ben Goldacre have pushed on this quite hard. There's now, clinical trials now have to be registered. They weren't before. So if previously you could potentially re register the ones you liked and not everything. Um, so I think just greater transparency of data and publishing helps in this area because it helps build trust that the scientific framework and the healthcare framework is a transparent one. Now, of course, there's issues of communications to the public, but I think you're definitely in a better position if you've got that part of your house in order. Um, as to the Edisonsty, somehow, you know, I don't know, maybe this is education, this idea that, you know, incidents, you know, this has come up in the press with the latest vaccine business, um, you know, co-events are not causality. Um, and that kind of basic principle seems to be hard to get across um, and isn't necessarily well reported by newspapers either. That's well. Um, Uma, did, did you have anything to add on this topic? If not, I'm going to pose the next question to you. Okay. <laughs> um, I hope I'm pronouncing this individual's name right. Uh, Freya asked a question that she wanted to pose to Uma. Um, do you agree that there is a need to focus on empowering organizations to actually help individuals balance the power imbalance that exists within the law? So often a lot of people, especially when it comes to owning their own data, because a lot of people often feel powerless when it comes to what they're putting out there in the world and what these organizations and companies are sort of taking in terms of their data or anything else. Um, do you think there's a, any sort of place for legal mechanisms or organizations to actually empower individuals? Well, one of the problems of the legal system, and I can especially talk about it from a UK perspective, is access to the law itself, isn't it? And the only way this can be done, and actually it was trialed first in Canada, damn Canada, and then in the UK, uh, where you do have tribunals. Um, and you have rules, um, very belatedly in the IP context, you have rules basically saying, this is for people to come. Uh, we were here, just, almost going back to an old fashioned, almost as if we're in a village where the elders come and you come and you, 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 you say your dispute and there is a discussion as to what's happening. Um, you do need tribunals where actually lawyers are not allowed because of the costs. Um, and, and therefore you, uh, you you get some, and you don't even need a, a qualified judge, but someone who comes from the industry, uh, someone who comes, who knows the area. Uh, it happens often in arbitration, but that would be the way. Uh, some countries, for example, Germany have very strong uh, consumer organizations that would help, other countries don't. So it's a very national based position as well. But um, and, and some countries can go to the data protection ombudsman, 
of course, um, that, that the way you can do a complaint. But I, I do feel there's something to be said about this openness, whether we could also switch, um, shift it to uh, open access to law, because that's, that's very tough, getting access to law. Um, Brigitte, I'm wondering if you have anything to add on that, because you do work in the more policy space on this on this side of things. So is there anything that you think in the policy world, uh, organizations or even politicians, whoever may be, can help empower individuals? Yeah, absolutely. I think law is is maybe made by governments, but it's meant to um, give a framework to every citizen's uh, life. So it it is also in the power of the citizens to influence their policymakers and uh, so that they have the policy framework that will meet their needs. So I think I would turn the question around and say, it's it's about empowering civil society and empowering those that represent the public interest to go and um, convince uh, the policymakers of the value uh, in making uh, scientific research open, in making data open for text and data mining, for all sorts of um, research uh, and, and building upon and collaboration in the scientific field, but also going beyond that, making sure that every citizen can have access to this information and in ways that they can understand it. Um, I think that knowing more, um, having, uh, sorry, having more open access to information will also help dispel misinformation and disinformation. There's been, as you mentioned, around the AstraZeneca vaccine, there's been a lot of information around, but what, uh, what about it is, is misinformation? What about it is disinformation? I think that the more open the conversation is, uh, the lower those risks are. And so I think I would turn it around and say it's about empowering civil society to uh, convince policymakers of the values of open in achieving those higher goals, which Uma mentioned are um, linked to human rights further down the line. The normal skeptic, Brigitte, I, I, I just... Um, I have heard of one major issue with empowering civil society organizations, uh, and it occurs to all sorts of organizations, and that's mandate. Uh, and that is something one has to cross. I believe in relation to, let's say, other organizations, that you have to show that you have the mandate of a certain amount of the society or the group or, you know, whatever you are speaking on behalf of. But that has been always a thorny issue is does this CSO have, does that organization have a mandate? And then what if you get a rival open access organization saying, no, it's us, we're the real ones. Um, a bit like the flat society, flat earth societies and rivals. And so that is something you need to think about, I think. How are you going to measure mandate? That's a really great point. Um, I am going to shift a little bit um, and pose a question to Tim, and I think Tarek might have something to say about this as well. Um, what do you see as being the major barriers today within the scientific community around adopting open access policies and a more open access ethos? Well, if you mean open publishing, then, you know, there's quite a lot of pressure. You know, we're just in the UK going through something called REF, the university level, um, which is a assessment of academic outputs. And you can't submit a paper if it's not open access. And so there are people now, you know, in our lists where, well, that would be the best paper to submit but actually we can't because it wasn't published open access. So there's real pressure now building up on academics to you know, do this, um, but it's still an incomplete picture. Um, so there's that side of things um, where, you know, the, the sort of mechanisms of oversight of science have just got to catch up with you know, making this enforced basically. Um, 
And it's quite a slow process since we've been doing that for about 20 years as well. Um, on the data side, um, again, there's been progress around if you publish something, the data has to be accessible. That's complicated by privacy, but there are mechanisms. Um, but it's just a rather incomplete um, and there's not always good enough support for the infrastructure to make that data accessible. And then if you've, you know, a lot of, there's another sort of side of all this in terms of trust in science, which is reproducibility. Um, can you demonstrate what's been done, you know, was correct? Can you actually go and redo the experiment? And making the data accessible and the code that you used accessible isn't quite enough in many cases to make it really easy for another scientist to come along and test, see if it was right or if there was an error. So there's still work to be done, you know, the whole bracket reproducible research agenda. Um, we're still quite a long way. And again, that requires push from funders, pushing things, um, pushing scientists to follow those sort of directions. And there are, there are you know, there's a UK wide organization um, for um, encouraging this, which is run by academics who are really enthusiastic about this sort of thing. Uh, I think Tim's point really hits the hammer on the head that uh, we as academics are kind of almost forced sometimes to not do open, open access. And even, for example, for me, when I went for promotion, there were these questions about, well, why are you not publishing in these other journals, um, your impact factor and things like this. And uh, there was actually a British professor who some of the, our British friends might know named Peter Murray Rust, who we brought in to kind of explain why, what the advantage was of doing some of this. So um, it, was, it was a tough journey. And similarly, it's hard for almost anybody who tries to go it open. Uh, and I think Tim explained that really, really well. The other piece, at least in hardware, is that everything that you do, somebody wants to monetize or commercialize. And so part of the, one of the big barriers is finding uh, a pocket of funding that's willing to work with you. And at the same time, like we're not even saying don't make money off of this, but let's make money in a way that's ethical and not abusive. Uh, which really is the pattern. People are used to robbing the public, and so it's hard to convince them, uh, especially some of these larger corporations, to tone it down, make a reasonable amount of money, and participate in the construction of a device that will hold no patents or will be openly accessible for other people to recreate. Rajit, did you have anything to add on that topic, question? Awesome. Um, we do have about five minutes left, so um, I would really like to end on a hopeful note here. So I'm going to I'm going to pose a question uh, to all the panelists. Um, and, and Tarek, you already kind of mentioned you talked a little bit about what you're doing at Glia, but I would really love to hear from each of you what you're working on right now that gives you hope for the future in terms of where we're going um, with open science and open data and open access. I saw Tim jump up, so Tim. <laughs> so, um, you know, I've, there's, if we're going to improve medicine, part of that equation is going to be data. There's a huge amount of data held on citizens in the healthcare system. and we can't, we haven't historically been able to analyze that. We're not interested in individuals except for improving their care. We're interested in, in the group and what the patterns say and how that might improve treatment processes or improve development of drugs. And finding a way to address that, to bridge between privacy and access. I mean, that's the, the trusted research environment stuff. That's basically what I'm working on at the moment. And we are trying to build up there's something called health data research uk in the uk which is our latest attempt to make it possible to do analysis across health data across the whole country in a secure way who would like to go next i'll just quickly say um 
it's not groundbreaking, but I'm trying to get the monograph out on um, another one. And this is to do with my particular thing about rights and, and education and, and health. Um, I'm trying to write as to how we can relook at the TRIPS agreement um, through a dignity framework uh, and take it out of trade. Uh, it was it was an accident that trade. Any links to that you can share on the work you you're currently working on? I, I will. Uh, is that is that someone to post it afterwards? Um, yeah, we can. You can share it with me, and I'll and I'll post it. Yeah. Yeah. Um. For me, I find that especially doing some of the work that I do both internationally and in Canada, that sometimes it's easy to forget how impactful each and every one of us is. You know, we look at some of the giants and we're convinced even that you have to be a giant to actually do something that matters, but you don't. And I'm not. And it's all of these little movements that help us move forward, that have moved science forward all these years. We are already winning. We've gone forward 20 or 25 years on open access in the past year during the pandemic. And now it's ours to lose. We just have to insist on it, keep driving it forward and make sure that, that the thing, the wins that we have made do not go backwards. So I'm really optimistic, actually. I'm very hopeful uh, with everything I see that we're just gonna continue to get better. And hopefully this has been like a ladder uh, so that we skip a few of these steps and keep moving forward. Hey, Brigitte, you get the last uh, last word here. <laughs> um, well, yeah, and before I, I, I forget, or if, if I don't have time, I want to thank the panelists um, for taking part in this conversation. It's been an honor to speak to you. Um, what a well, what a learning experience also about all the different ways that one can understand the word open and apply it practically uh, in in different fields of science and law and um, I think it's been a, a very uh, fruitful and and enriching conversation so um, I can just mention uh, in closing that Creative Commons is uh, working on these questions. We're very interested in the the new era of open that has been triggered in part by the increased interest in this concept that the COVID-19 pandemic has triggered. And in line with our three strategic goals that uh, are part of a new strategy we adopted just um, a few months ago, uh, we'll continue to advocate for policy change. Uh, for example, we're involved in uh, informing the process on the UNESCO recommendation on open science. So this is something that we are uh, currently invested in. Uh, we will also continue to build infrastructure uh, around the licenses and the tools to make uh, content more freely and openly accessible, uh, promoting open access to scientific publications and research outputs, uh, including data and uh, open software. And we all will also be guiding institutions, so research institutions in moving from close to open by creating, adopting, and implementing open access policies for the uh, products and outputs that they generate. Um, so I'm very excited about the future of open. And um, I'd like to thank, before handing over to Victoria, thank the panelists once more and the participants um, for your great questions. And, um, and really, I look forward to con continuing this conversation in one way or another. So, thank you.